and you can introduce yourselves on the chat. Um, this session will be about London's railway infrastructure and how it continues to shape our city um, and provide interesting opportunities additional to the purposes for which it was originally intended. My name is Rachel Aldridge, Project Officer here at CLP, and I'll be guiding you through the next 45 minutes. Um, so before we make a start, this is being recorded and will be available um, to view via our YouTube channel. Also, there's definitely more than one person tuning in today, despite what it may see, what may well, what it may say on your screen. Um, if you do have any difficulty seeing or hearing during the session, then please make sure you've joined us via Google Chrome, because we find that this browser works best. Um, and if you've got any problems at all, please try logging out and rejoining. So for today's session, we'll be joined by some experts in their fields. We have Hassanal of Camden Town Unlimited Business Improvement District, um, Val Byrne from Better Bankside Bid, um, and Josh West, Communications and Business Development Manager here at CRP. And Fiona Cool is also facilitating the chat function throughout the session. Um, so yeah, do type in any questions you have into the bottom right of your screen. We will cover all of these topics on your screen during today's session, um, and there'll be a chance for you to hear answers to some questions at the end of each of the presentations. Um, but if we don't have enough time, we will respond to everything via a follow-up email tomorrow. If you do have any extra questions that you'd like to ask our speakers about anything to do with railway infrastructure uses, um, then please chat them, um, put them into the chat box at any time. Um, yeah, it'd be good if you could add your name and organization too. So I'm just going to run through a little bit of context before we delve into the details of innovations relating to railway infrastructure. Um, but just in case any of you out there are new to Crossroad Partnership, CLP was formed 27 years ago to build bridges across the River Thames. CLP's vision is to empower people to deliver innovative projects um, that support places to respond well to the significant challenges that the capital faces. These are the values that CLP holds um, dear to everything it does. To change and sharing approaches between many different organizations in lots of different locations. And today, CLP is delivering London's future improvement districts and communities. We're delivering a wide range of projects um, and we're extremely grateful to our partners and funders for making this possible. The Mayor's Air Quality Fund and Central Government Department DEFRA are our major funders, um, with DEFRA supporting CLP's Clean Air Villages project in, in particular. These past projects light at the end of the tunnel. Um, in 2002, this programme identified this 10 kilometre stretch of overground railway viaducts, so stretching across the boroughs of Lambeth and Southwark um, and encompassing 60 tunnels. It's dark, forbidding, kind of dangerous barriers to free movement, um, community activity um, and economic growth. CLP sets about an ambitious phased programme of transformations to these underloved public spaces using the Section 106 planning gain um, monies to fund them. And they are now kind of railway art restaurants, bars, parks, exhibitions, installations, um, and interactions um, and the results speak for themselves and we're really pleased that CRP partner organisations like Better Bankside and Camden Town Unlimited um, have now taken up the mantle themselves um, but more on that later. So with a bit of creativity the spaces underneath and alongside railway viaducts can perform a variety of beneficial purposes um, while at the same time continuing to serve as carriers of rail trains themselves if that's desired. And it's exactly these 3D approaches to spaces at all levels uh, that we need to continue to encourage moving forwards. This creates space for many different uses um, to function effectively. So in order to inspire us with Camden Town Unlimited's regeneration of railway viaducts, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Hassanal. So over to you. Hello, can everyone hear me? Just double checking my audio. 
Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. All right, then. So to kick off, I just wanted to say thank you to Cross River Partnership. If you haven't come across them, then definitely check them out. If you're not a member, then definitely don't know what you're waiting for. So they're an amazing organization and we love working with them personally ourselves. So let's kick off the Camden Highline. I work for Camden Town Unlimited and um, we're hopefully going to be building an amazing park in the sky. We're part of several organizations. The organizations deliver various things, but this is what allows us to basically get our core funding, Camden Town Unlimited Business Improvement District, to be able to do direct projects and indirect projects via other vehicles like the Camden Highland Charity or Camden Collective. We're really good at basically using other people's assets temporarily. So we take it over, um, provide meanwhile use, whether it's retail space that you can see in the middle there on the left hand side, that was an abandoned hospital that we turned into um, incubator and workspace. But we've, we've got used to basically taking on infrastructure or buildings or spaces in general and um, giving them back to the owners. So we thought, hold on a second, we came across the Highline concept and then an article. And obviously everyone knows the New York Highline, Everyone probably doesn't know the fact that the Paris Highline actually was first before the New York Highline, but the, <laughs> things get lost in narrative. That's what inspired us to think about our own Highline. There were various options in Camden, but luckily, on our, right on our doorstep was this option right here. Um, not quite clearly labelled, but hopefully you can imagine, use your imagination, King's Cross all the way to Camden Town. So that's where our stretch of the Highline would be. Um, this is a bit of visualization here. You can see it there going um, east to west. And we're hoping that, to give you a context, this is a historic look back at the, um, um, I guess, the tourist sort of mapping of London. And then when you have the Jubilee Line, I think it was the Jubilee Line. Yeah, the Jubilee Line open, um, the South Bank open, on those sorts of things. Um, tourism hotspots expanded down in the south and then king's cross is expanding it here and then you'll be able to see that houston is hopefully going to expand it there and what we like to think is the high line will kind of complete this sort of area in the north for tourism as a destination in camden town hopefully what it does is um, it unlocks green space, which is amazing. There's four um, estates that the Highland will be running straight past. This is a 400 meter boundary that you can see here. And this 400 meter unlocks, um, I believe it's 10,000 residents who do not have, currently have green space within a 400 meter radius to green space. And that's one of the major objectives. When you expand that to 500 meters, it becomes 20,000 residents, which is, I think, awesome. Everyone needs a bit of green space, so hopefully the Highline will deliver that. The Highline, this has been a long journey for us, um, various conversations, um, various thinking. So it's not something that we've just suddenly come up with. These are some visualizations of um, Kentish Town. This is Camden um, Road Park. You'll see um, of what the Highline may look like coming up and down from the potential Highline. Um, one of the big wins for us is um, TFL are up for putting a um, ticket point straight so you can come straight on and off the highland onto camden road station on the overground which would be amazing um then this is um another look from camden road station so there's a lot of possibilities in terms of what will be up in the highland there's different dynamics um will it be walled will it not be walled it'd be awesome if you could see the trains but at the same time if it needs to be walled um for various purposes or if segments couldn't be um visible then there's a lot more opportunity as well with those walls how we use them how we use those spaces there'll be various entry and exit points there will be um th there's a lot of um, possibilities with the highline hopefully uh, but initially when we started we raised um crowdfunding we wanted to make sure that there was that local support and um being locally focused was very important for us we had over 300 um, do do donations, most of which were small donations. We had loads of great um, PR from the Highlands, or so even before the Highlands opened up, a lot of positive support, um, a lot of community engagement, a lot of great press, a lot of great headlines. And um, interestingly, over, I think, 15 or 1,600 people have now gone on walks on the Highland route 
even before it's built, which is quite interesting, I thought. Um, a lot of people are really interested and buzzing about the Highland before it's even built. Lots of political support, lots of strategic support. And of course, as I mentioned, the community stakeholders are really important because they're effectively the ones we need to gain um, blessings from and permission from. And all of these organizations and stakeholders and communities are on board and we had to sort of communicate with them, have that dialogue and see what they want. Then we had obviously the um, direct stakeholders, the I guess you could say the key holders of the gatekeepers. So making sure that everyone was happy, network rails on board, working out the heads of terms, how, how would this be um, managed? How would how would it be viable? And of course, um, of, of, in terms of viability, what the crowdfunding paid for was the engineering report, which allowed us to basically say, yep, this is viable, we can go ahead. We had loads of economic and social benefits that we um, derived from that report. We had over a thousand hours of school engagement, children engagement. We had a lot of volunteering. I think there's 300 friends of the Highline that help um, do the Highline, uh, sort of clean up the area, um, interact, volunteer, which is which is amazing. And I think I've already touched on this in terms of transport benefits because Camden Town is a bottleneck for the Northern Line. And King's Cross is also a bit of a bottleneck. So anywhere we can ease congestion on Camden Road, Camden Town Tube Station, and get people to walk, it really helps TfL. So the New York Highland, you may or may not know, was built in stages. And the idea is we would do the exact same thing. We'd be, build it hopefully in three phases. And uh, we broke down the cost. We've paid for the feasibility, that's all done and dusted. Pre-planning, we're, we're, we're all paid up for and we're working through this right now. And the next stage is for us to raise the capital for um, delivering the project. But that's on a stage by stage basis. We needed to know where the income is gonna come from because you can get your capital, but how are you gonna maintain your site? How are you gonna maintain the park? How are you gonna maintain all the infrastructure? So we looked at various types of organizations, um, museums, charities, um, parks, the New York Highline, for example, where were the um, distribution of income? What would work might not work for us. And again, these these are some of the school kids that we um, we we hosted a gallery to show their work. This is um, us kind of giving a taster to the community of what the Highline will hopefully bring. We had a lot of art classes, exhibitions. Um, as I mentioned, three hundred volunteers helped build, clean up, and contribute to this. So it was a real community effort. We, we, we got everyone stuck in. So this is a visualization of how we like to see um, the spaces in between the communities. So we run Camden Town Bid, as mentioned, Houston Town Bid, and we also do a lot of work with neighboring communities. But we felt as though this is a nice way to show how the different parts in between are connecting and what the green spaces are available to those communities in between. And the Highland complements that quite nicely. We ran a competition which was really successful, an international one, 75 entries. The successful candidates just so happened to be field operations who helped build um, the Olympic Park and also designed and um, helped with the New York Highline, which obviously put us on the map in terms of how people perceived our um, intentions because they were like, wow, um, they, they, they're going with the people that um, have actually helped build the actual New York Highline. Of course, it wasn't just because of that. It was the amazing team they brought in, the local community aspects. Um, one of the um, team organizations, Street Space, has already recruited, under engagement and stuff, recruited a local resident um, from the community to basically help with outreach and engagement. So um, we're already doing that grass level sort of stuff. Again, since the competition launched, amazing press coverage. We made it. We, we hit the New Yorker. So um, as Simon would say, we, 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 can, we can just be done now the guardian evening stand all those sorts of great great sort of um things even before the high line has been built there's lots of obviously ideas that um, field operations have in terms of what we might do what we might not do and uh, this is just a summary of everything basically i spoke about so our progress to, to date hopefully i was under 10 minutes <laughs> whistle blow to her Perfect. Thank you very much, Hasanul. Um, yeah, really interesting overview of the High Line and the different use spaces. Um, I think if anyone's got any questions, please feel free to put these in the chat. But for the interest of time, we'll move, we will move on to Val's presentation. Um, yeah, so over to you, Val, for the low line. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Rachel. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear oh, you. Oh, perfect. <laughs> 
Um, thank you very much. Um, so very pleased to, to be here. I'm um, Valerie Byrne from Better Bankside, and I am presenting today on behalf of the Low Line Steering Group, which is a, a partnership um, that we coordinate on behalf of the um, organizations that you can see there on the, the screen. Um, the Low Line is a long-term partnership initiative that's very much focusing on the elevated um, railway viaducts that um, crisscross this part of South London. So we're based in Bankside, um, which is just across the river from the city of London. Um, and the, the low line area sort of covers the, the area between um, Southwark Tube Station in the west, all the way down to the biscuit factory in Bermondsey in the east. So it covers about a three and a half kilometer stretch of, of railway viaduct. Um, it's as I said, it's a partnership initiative um, uh, coordinated by, by Better Bank Side, but very much a, 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 a sort of collective endeavour. It has three sort of interlinked themes um, that are very much uh, kind of structured around the social, economic, and environmental opportunities presented by the spaces and the arches themselves, but also the, the streets and spaces along the base of the viaduct um, across these areas. Um, so it's more a, a project sort of of the city um, as, as opposed to kind of the, the elevated parks, which kind of sit above above the city, which we've just heard about. So quite um, different in, in many respects. Um, as Rachel alluded to earlier, there's there's been a lot of thought um, over the years about kind of the, the railway viaducts in our neck of the woods and how they can be improved um, over the years from the light at the end of the tunnel to um, the banks at Urban Forest um, work that we've done at Better Bankside through to Team London Bridge, um, who looked at the, the opportunities in the arches as a, a sort of creative maker spaces um, about 10 years ago. And it wasn't really until 2012 when a local resident entered an ideas competition, um, which was called a High Line for London, the ideas competition. It was run by the Landscape Institute and a local resident um, entered an idea which was very much about opening up the, the route along the base of the railway viaducts in Bankside and encouraging sort of greater um, use of them, you know, by people walking, cycling along. Um, that idea really sort of captured the um, imaginations of local um, people, local organisations, and we at Better Bankside sort of picked up the mantle and did some further sort of... Um, thought leadership, I suppose, around that idea, thinking how it might work in, in Bankside. And we undertook some sort of detailed surveys and studies um, and kind of looked at, at where the opportunities were. And it, it sort of gradually sort of, um, you know, spread further and, and Team London Bridge started looking at the viaduct in their neck of the woods and, and likewise kind of further east. And it wasn't until about 2016 that um, two sort of developments in Bankside opened, which really sort of showcased the how the viaduct could be transformed by kind of thinking a bit more holistically about the, the routes and spaces along the base of the viaduct and the uses within the, the viaduct. And these were two, um, two developments, one sort of privately led, the other, and um, this one is Union Yard Arches, which was delivered by Network Rail, you know, which transformed, um, you know, empty derelict spaces into sort of thriving economic, um, you know, hubs of activity with um, connections kind of running through. So previously you wouldn't have been able to walk along the viaduct here. And these two projects really sort of started to bring the low line idea to life. Um, and then we at Better Bank Side sort of looked at where we could um, start to, to kind of elevate the, the visibility of the low line and get people thinking more about how it could be achieved. Um, we implemented um, this uh, wayfinding project, which encouraged people to explore the, the viaduct across Bankside. And also in that year, Southwark Council um, really saw the, the sort of value of the, the arches and the routes along the base. And, and they um, have now got um, two policies within their new Southwark plan, which specifically relates to the, the, um, the, the railway viaduct and the low line, which is a fantastic sort of policy lever for us um, to, you know, to realise the low line in this part of the world. And one of the big reasons we're doing this project is because of the the, the sort of physical barriers that the, the railway viaducts um, 
present, you know, it's a real sort of cliff edged economic activity as you move sort of further away from the river. So these projects are all about trying to unlock some of the economic um, potential of, of the arches and the spaces alongside, but also to, to you know, uh, bridge that, that sort of um, barrier, I suppose, to, to opportunity um, and, and link with communities a bit further south in the borough. Um, there's a huge amount of potential in this neck of the woods. Um, we've got nearly 400 railway arches in the, the project area that we're working in. Um, about, I think, 30% of those are empty. So there's a huge, huge opportunity to kind of um, bring those arches back into to more productive use. Um, and the, you know, the economic sort of case for this is is really compelling. And the, you know, when you look at the floor area of the arches, you know, there's about two and a half, um, you know, the equivalent of two and a half gherkins kind of in the railway viaduct in, in the, the low line area, which, um, you know, which is a huge, huge opportunity. Um, so on the back of all of this, we've been um, convening the, the Low Line Partnership for about three years um, now, formally. We have a, a Friends of the Low Line group similar to the, the High Line in, in Camden. Um, we've been very successful at um, securing some investment from the mayor. So it, we've, um, we secured uh, funding from both uh, Round 1 and Round 2 of Good Growth Fund. Um, and they, that was very much about building the, the partnership, proving the, the sort of um, the, the business case. And then more recently, we've got kind of capital funding to deliver projects, which we're in the throes of, of working on now. And all of this is kind of responding to sort of strategic um, issues facing um, London more broadly around climate change, around, um, you know, deprivation and uh access to green space and, um, you know, all of those uh, themes around kind of the social, environmental, economic imperatives. Um, so we have a programme of works that's uh, kind of loosely based or loosely structured around the three themes of, of green infrastructure and um, connectivity and active travel and um, re, re sort of repurposing and um, re adapting the underused arches into productive um, spaces. And that's sort of manifesting on the ground through a whole range of different projects from very small scale um, greening initiatives like this one in Bankside, which although it's, it's very small, it provides a real opportunity sort of to, to galvanize people around, um, you know, caring for the area and looking after these spaces. These are a bunch of volunteers working on this um, little garden um, from the, the businesses in Bankside. But it's also looking at... Um, you know, opportunities for, for wider greening adjacent to the, the railway viaduct. And this is a great project um, in London Bridge, uh, the, the Druid Street Meadow, which um, Team London Bridge helped deliver with Southwark Council. So we're looking at all of these opportunities along the base of the, the viaduct to, to retrofit more greening, more sustainable drainage, um, and to provide those spaces for people to um, to come together and to, to provide that um, space for people to connect with, with nature. Um, we're also very much kind of passionate about the whole active travel and how we can support more walking and cycling um, in the neighbourhood. Um, Team London Bridge are leading on the, um, this fantastic cycle freight project, which is all about helping businesses based in the, the railway viaduct reduce their freight um, footprint and, and sort of using bike freight to reduce the diesel trips along the, the low line. This project launched um, last month and it's it's a kind of 18 month um, pilot which will involve all of the, the businesses based in, in businesses um, along the railway viaduct and also in the sort of wider area. Um, and we also, you know, are very much passionate about promoting walking and exploration along the route. So like Camden Town, we've, we've hosted lots of walking tours, lots of um, activities along the line. We even have our own soundtrack for the low line. We um, commissioned a, a, a creative cultural project a couple of years ago called Musicity. So we have a number of site specific um, music tracks that you have to kind of walk along the, the railway and um, find the places that they relate to to unlock the, um, the the songs on your on your phone, which is great. And then the big sort of um, strand of work that's currently underway is um, a number of projects that are uh, sort of capital projects that are re repurposing a number of arches in Bankside. And um, there's another project in Hollywood Street, which is very much about um, showcasing the opportunity of, of sites along the railway viaduct. Um, so not necessarily in the arches, but maybe across the road from the viaduct. 
And in Bankside, we have a, a lease on three arches that were, uh, that were previously um, derelict and empty. And we are um, working with a local firm of architects to develop a, a system for kind of adapting um, and repurposing the space inside those arches to accommodate a whole range of different um, uses. So we're calling them mixed occupier test beds because we're trying to test out different um, different kind of types of uses in, in different arches. But we're using this common language of these Nissan huts um, within the arch spaces as the, sort of the, the common design language across the, the, the spaces. So we've got two arches on Eura Street, which um, is just back here is over here towards the western end um, in Bankside. That's going to be a sustainable travel hub where we will have a um, secure bike uh, storage facility for local employees. Um, but we'll also be running a green logistics center um, from that uh, art, which is really exciting. Um, and here you can see the the the, the sort of um, the storeroom, I suppose, for that um, green logistics center almost uh, complete here. That's a, a project that we're offering, um, rolling out to businesses and bank side to help reduce um, their freight footprint. So we're doing a lot around freight reduction and uh, cycle freight and last mile deliveries, all of that um, sort of thing, <laughs> which um, was probably a, a topic for a, a different um, presentation, but we're really excited to host that in the arch. And it's, it's incredible how flexible the arch spaces are. And then we have another, um, arch on Southwark Street, which is uh, a much more sort of different arch in terms of scale and footprint. Um, so in there, we're looking at a sort of flexible cultural and community space that can be used on a sessional basis by local um, charities and social enterprises to really showcase some of the, the talent that is in the neighbourhood. And we're, we're really excited um, about that prospect. And, you know, it's just for us, it's really exciting that, um, you know, that we're able to, to sort of work within the arch structures themselves and really test um, different ways of working, different ways of fitting out an arch and, and really sort of see how that works and to, um, you know, to develop a prototype that maybe can be scaled up in, in other arches across the, the low line and further afield. Um, as I mentioned, in, in Hollywood Street and London Bridge, there's a beautiful um, kiosk structure being built just on, on a little plot of land adjacent to the viaduct. And that's a great example of, of showcasing how developers with sites um, immediately sort of by the viaduct can really contribute to um, realizing the, the low line. Um, and that's um, on site due to complete in the next number of weeks. So um, you can pop along and, and visit that very soon. And then finally, we're also interested in the streets and spaces along the, the base of the viaduct. So, um, you know, we have a number of projects that are on the, the drawing board that are very much kind of public realm focused, looking at how we can retune the streets to make them greener, more walking, walking friendly, more cycling friendly. And so we have a number of projects um, that are on, on underway on that front as well. Um, and this is a, a sort of concept sketch from, from one of our designers on that. Um, and I think I will wrap up there, but it's a very whistle-stop um, tour, but hopefully it gives you a flavour of the, the scale and the opportunities um, that we're exploring in Bankside and London Bridge and Bermondsey. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much, Val. Um, we did have a pre-asked question from the audience um, about using digital technologies as part of the visitor experience. So for residents, workers, tourists, I know you spoke about the music kind of associated with the low line, but I just wondered if there were any other um, digital initiatives. Yeah, we've, um, yeah, the, the musicity was a really interesting um, Kind of opportunity for us to kind of test out some of the, the digital side of things and it's it's been really really popular um and yeah like i'd encourage people to, to check it out if, if you haven't already come across it um we've also done sort of audio tours um in in bermondsey our, our partners there have um done a sort of extensive kind of local history research and they've um created a, a sort of story about the, the viaduct in, in their neck of the woods. And it's very much kind of aimed at, um, at families that might live in the, the neighborhood or, or more, more further afield um, to encourage them to come out and explore what's on their doorstep. So we're always you know, looking for, for ways to 
you know, for new ways to engage people in, in what we're doing and to encourage people to, um, you know, to explore what's on their doorstep and um, enjoy what's on their, their doorstep. So, you know, we'd love to hear more from, from the person who asked that question, if they have any ideas that they want to, to sort of contribute as well. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, we can put you in touch. Definitely. Thank um, you. We've got time for maybe one minute answer for another question from Laura in the chat. So on the Green Logistics Hub under the arch, um, just wondering who the main stakeholders were involved um, yeah. in making that happen. So um, it's, I think we, we're getting some funding for that um, through Transport for London's freight team. Um, I, it's a project I'm not leading on. So um my, my colleague Amandeep is probably a better place to answer it, but I, I know it's been um, funded in part by, by Transport for London to, to their um, freight team and, and they have a pot of funding where they're piloting different um, projects aimed at kind of reducing, um, you know, diesel and, and petrol freight uh, in, in London. Um, and then we, we're we sort of teaming up with a, a cycle freight um, provider on, on kind of the, the delivery of the service. We have a, I believe we have a, a cycle freight provider who will be sort of doing the last mile sort of deliveries for, for local businesses. And then we as the bid are kind of the broker in terms of recruiting businesses to use the, you know, to use the facility and, um, you know, doing all that engagement with the, the business side of things. Perfect. Thank you very much for your presentation, Van, for those answers. Um, amazing. So I'll Thank now you. like to pass on to Josh from CRP, who will be speaking about rail freight. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you can all hear me. Apologies in advance. It seems like my neighbours just on cue started to mow his hedge. So apologies if you hear any uh, mowing sounds. Um, uh, I'll be giving an update on Cross River Partnerships Clean Air Villages 4 project, um, particularly focusing on the rail freight intervention that we are researching and exploring. So in contrast to Val and Hassanal's presentations, um, I'll be looking at something a bit more traditional from rail. Um, for those that are new to Clean Air Villages 4, this is a DEFRA funded 15 month project led by Westminster City Council. And this is in collaboration with 26 project partners. The aim is to improve air quality across different London villages where both air pollution and population, population density levels are high um, to deliver ambitious freight solutions for a clean air business recovery from COVID-19. So I thought I'd just kick off with um, some key facts to put rail freight in the UK into context. So feel free to um, post your guesses in the chat box. So how much does rail freight contribute to the UK economy? A, 100 million, B, 550 million, or 1.7 billion? What are people guessing? Got an A, some Cs. It's actually 1.7 billion. I can't even fathom that amount in my own head, but um, what about for this one? Each freight train takes approximately how many HGVs off the road? 10, 38, or 76? 76, 38, some Cs. Yeah, anybody with a 76, you are correct. And finally, how much freight was moved in Great Britain in 2020, 2021? 3 billion, 9 billion, or 15 billion nets on kilometres. I think you might be seeing a running theme here. So they're all say so, all, <laughs> all of the largest amounts. But it, um, yeah, it just really puts into context how much it's, um, how much it is a vital part of the UK transport network. So in terms of COVID on the impact of rail freight, so um, rail has really been crucial during the pandemic um, in transporting essential supplies. Network rail increased capacity for freight um, due to the dramatically reduced passenger numbers. And overall, in, in, in essence, it, it really did show efficiency, flexibility and reliability um, at a time when resources were need at, needed at pace um, and more than ever. 
And just an example there from the um, China to Europe freight trains, which transported 9.3 million items of medical equipment, which is a hell of a lot. So why the focus on freight in the first place? So um, almost all of London's freight is moved by road. So it accounts for over 10% of PM 2.5 emissions that are emitted um, and around a fifth of traffic in the capital is generated by this. So, um, but however, London's rail network carries more than 10 million tonnes of construction material per year. So it's how can this be increased without impacting passenger services that are already stressed? Um, vehicle traffic levels in London have now surpassed pre-pandemic levels, um, leading to increased congestion. And this costs the London economy 9.5 billion a year. Um, and freight traffic has actually increased as well by 39% over the last 25 years. And that's just projected to increase, um, especially with the extra demand from, from London's 9 million plus population. Um, the ULES expansion is definitely welcomed to dramatically improve the air quality. Um, however, it will be a dampener um, for road freight. So it's, it's just taken into that that into consideration. Um, and in order for London to meet its carbon neutral target by 2030, um, and the UK's overall target of 78% reduction by 2035, um, rail freight really could help to meet this, this target as 76% um, less carbon dioxide is per tonne of cargo is transported compared to on the road. So, so it's clear that rail is it's a safer, it's a cleaner, and has left as less of an impact on our street environment compared to road freight. Um, just some, just a, some examples of what is actually transported by road freight, uh, rail freight rather. Um, so London's construction sector depends on rail freight for materials to develop housing, business facilities, and major infrastructure projects. Um, it supports vital movements and of containerized goods. Um, and is a key link in supply chains, not just for the capital, but for the southeast and nationwide as well. Import and export movements of cars, automotive parts really rely on these um, London lines. And actually, uh, something I didn't realise as well is that a substantial proportion of the city's waste is removed by rail as well. Um, and just how it supports other transport networks. So Heathrow Airport um, is supplied with a fifth of its aviation fuel by cross London flows of freight trains. So some of the challenges ahead, a lot of these I've had a look at and have been lifted from the London Rail Freight Strategy Summary Report, um, which was produced by um, Network Rail not long ago, about a month or two ago. Um, so London has been dominated by passenger-led projects in recent years, such as Crossrail and the southern developments of HS2. However, there is a really strong long-term growth in demand for rail freight services. Um, expected between now and 2043 and a shift in focus must encompass freight as well as passengers um, network capacity so at present freight trains must share busy routes in and out of london um, where the need for passenger capacity is already high like i mentioned before the network capacity so it, the infrastructure upgrades that are needed um, taking into consideration things like you know the maximum length of trains the weight restrictions of carriages, um, the restriction by structures that they must have to pass through, such as tunnels, always a challenge. Um, and in, in addition, it's the availability of suitable terminals to allow the loading and offloading um, to take place and for operations to be as, a, as efficient as possible. Um, and whilst there's a need to develop the rail freight network for future freight growth, Doing so can only be effective if there's a sufficient number of these yards or terminals um, for goods to be moved in between. And finally, funding. So always a biggie. Um, the primary source of funding for enhancements to the national rail network um, is the Department for Transport's Rail Network Enhancements Pipeline, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, the London Rail Freight Strategy Report just lays out a long term set of options for this um, with a view to implementing these across a 30-year period but 
obviously this is in, in light of the constraint funding environment of the impact of COVID-19 on the rail industry. So um, they've definitely noted that the larger schemes in particular are expected to be, to be processed um, to development only when affor affordability permits it. Um, but in the meantime, Network Rail will focus on progressing the recommendations of the strategy that do not depend on that RNEP funding. So what is the Clean Air Villages for Rail Freight focusing on in particular? Um, so we're going to be researching the opportunities for light rail, as well as um, uh, taking into account the freight friendly carriage designs that could be there and linking this with accessibility improvements as well. And just also exploring the opportunities and challenges with nighttime movements of freight through this manner. Um, we're looking at it as in, you know, rail freight is not in a silo, everything is interconnected. So um, our other project interventions, which are examining ways in which a holistic, sustainable freight journey can be delivered at scale. Um, so this is looking at taking on board electric vehicle transport on the roads, um, cargo boats and ships on the tidal Thames, as well as the consolidation hub capabilities at each intersection. So we're definitely interested in people getting in touch with us about this. If people use light rail, their challenges that they face, the barriers, and also if it's been a successful for them. So our contact details will be at the end of this presentation. We'd be really happy to um, take any questions and hear from you as well. So um, thank you very much. That's it from me. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, we've had a couple of questions through from the audience. We'll definitely make sure to follow up with any um, that we haven't answered now. Um, but we did have a question that was pre-asked, um, which was, what plans are there for the facilitation of rail transfer centres and hubs in the London area? Um, I don't know if you had a response to that one, Josh. Yes, yeah, it's a really good question. Like I was saying before, those terminals and yards are absolutely crucial if um, if anything is to, to be enhanced and upgraded. But one thing I would note was about um, potential urban logistics hubs and micro logistics hubs, especially those which are in close proximity to rail stations um, that do accommodate freight in the first place. They could be an answer. Um, CRP has an online resource for local authorities and landowners to plot potential urban logistics and micro site spaces across London. Um, and this would be so that interested operators could review and inquire about occupying these spaces. So I think they could be crucial going forward. Um, the CAV4 project is also trialling the movement of freight from um, a SEVA logistics owned Dartford consolidation hub. Um, and then this is trialling the movement of freight along the Thames to hopefully a logistics hub in central London where the last mile will be distributed by EV or a cargo bike. So again, looking at that full um, cradle to grave journey of the, of the product. Um, just taking into account waterways as well. So um, the PLA is currently conducting a feasibility study on the handling of light freight along the Thames. and. Um, the peer infrastructure requirements that are needed to handle movements of freight um, as well as passengers and there could be a real significant opportunity in the future for rail to connect with the water in order to further ease this pressure off the road network. Um, the strategy that I was talking about before, the London Rail Freight Strategy Report, it mentions this lack of um, nodal standard yards beside um, Acton and Wembley in particular. Um, and also the south of the Thames and this general need for further capacity for the laying over of wagons between circuits um, in order to support this continued growth. Um, and there really is this exciting opportunity to utilise different modes for um, a holistic sustainability journey. Um, yes, hopefully that answers it in a little bit of a nutshell, but um, Happy to go into further detail once I've um, consulted with some <laughs> members of my team. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and yeah, huge thank you to all our speakers, um, Hassanal and Val as well. I hope you found the information really thought provoking and that you've had kind of, yeah, um, a glimpse of some further knowledge. Um, 
and some of the many possibilities of railway lines, viaducts, arches, stations. Uh, as I mentioned, all unanswered questions we will follow up with outside of this live session. Um, yeah, I'd just like you to point. I'd like to point you to our next lunchtime launch session, um, which will be in three weeks' time on the nineteenth of August. At uh, the same time, 1.15 until 2. And the topic will be to do with the River Thames, um, the future of sustainable shipping and trade in London. We'll be joined by colleagues from Port of London Authority. Um, so definitely do sign up. Um, but yeah, any queries um, that you have, please don't hesitate to get in contact with any one of us. Um, our contact details are on the screen now. Um, yeah, just once again, I'd like to thank all our speakers for some really great presentations and thank you for tuning in and participating. Thank you.